Hey, everybody. Welcome to the very first episode of Trampoline Insight. I'm Stephen Gluckstein. And I'm Nuno Marino. And our main goal here at this podcast is to share insight of trampoline, the sport of trampoline, and all it entails. Stephen, are we the first trampoline gymnastics podcast ever? I think we might be. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent certain. I think there was. I think uh, one of the coaches here in the USA, Trey, was trying to do something for a little bit, but I don't know if it ever went out or on what platform it was ever posted. So we might be. I tried to do a search about it, and I couldn't find anything right now at this very moment. So maybe I'm mistaken. But if I'm mistaken, please correct us and make sure you let us know if there is another trampoline gymnastics podcast. I think I think it's exciting too because I think there's a number of different podcasts and videos for our men's artistic and women's artistic and kind of trampoline usually gets the leftovers from artistic. So I think this is going to be something special, something that uh, TNT athletes can uh, relate to, and and most trampoline coaches and athletes and officials are not doing it for money; they're doing it for passion. And um, so I think having something a podcast you're so passionate about is going to be good for them i think it's going to be fun i agree i agree i agree and just to just to add on to that i think it's going to be a space that is open for everyone to send us questions or ask us questions and we'll we'll answer on the next episode and we just want everyone to be open and we understand straight, straightforward communication with everyone that's all i think that we need to have for our sport to grow bigger and bigger so let's start episode one yeah, and I think I think the communication is huge. You know, it's like if you, and, and thanks to technology, it's you know the sport is evolving because before you had to go wait until you're at an international competition or a national competition to see other coaches and other athletes and and kind of see what their tricks are and what they're doing, and and now it can be shared literally in an instant. So, uh, you know, what well, I wonder what I wonder how we would be off if we had technology. Uh, the t- technology and communication there is now back when we were, were jumping. I don't know. I don't know. I, I keep thinking about myself in that position and what would I have done differently? And I don't know. I think I would have been a better athlete as a whole. That's all. That's all I can say. It just, it's, it's the, I was already very competitive. I still am very competitive, but I was even more competitive was I when, when I was an athlete and the, being able to see what my adversaries, adversaries, were doing at the time, I think would have given me even more, <laughs> more training ethics and better training ethics and everything. I think I would have done even better than than I would than, than what I believe I did. But yeah. So why don't I agree. why don't we take the because it's the first episode? Why don't we take a minute to kind of introduce ourselves, our background, where we come from, what we did as an athlete. So why don't you, why don't you go first and, and tell us where you're from, your background, and, and all that jazz. Perfect, perfect. So, um, uh, my name is Nuno, as we already said before. I was born in Portugal. Uh, I lived in Portugal until I was 33 years old. During those 33 years old, I started gymnastics when I was four years old, just gymnastics, and I moved to trampoline and tumbling when I was seven. So, at seven years old, that was the first time that I actually jumped on a mini trampoline at the time. The club did not have anything else. It only had a mini trampoline, no double mini and no trampoline. Like a like a so, like a mini one, like you run and jump off of. Correct, just a mini trampoline. Okay, if you go to the if you go to the Eurotramp website, you can still buy those, and and they they were different at the time. At the time, they had elastics, no sports. Wasn't 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 that like a discipline or a sport at one time? You Especially in Europe, right? In Europe, you are it was correct. pretty big, I think. I, uh, I, I, I can verify it, but I believe to this day, people still do competitions of mini trampoline in Portugal. I, I, oh, I, wow. I have to verify. I know when I left, there was still all championships up to national championships of mini trampoline. That was still a discipline in Portugal when I left in 2013. So, yes, that's how I started. And from there, double mini and then trampoline. And uh, yeah, but uh, the first trampoline we had in our gym was an elastic trampoline with elastics was so hard to jump on <laughs> so hard to jump on people would not believe that it was so hard to jump on it was very very hard and then i guess evolution new equipment and many many years of competing and did 
nine world championships and seven European championships when it was the time only one every two years. Um, one Olympic Games, alternate for two more. And yeah, I'm very satisfied with all that I've done. So how, how old were you? I don't know if we were got, we froze for a second there. How old were you when you switched from the gym that you had the, the mini trampoline to a gym that you had the, the regular trampoline? And I'm assuming that so, the new gym that had a, was, it was a seven by 14? Yes, but it was the same gym initially. So initially oh, okay. it was the same gym, but just new equipment, new material, everything involved was the same gym. And it, it was a seven by 14. I believe, I'm trying to remember, but uh, after that old Nissan one that we have, then the next one we had was already a, a seven by 14 year trend. Yes, it was. Uh, after that, then with evolution, then just ultimates like we have today, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And I know, I know it's a constant problem, at least here in the United States. What were your ceiling heights like at that gym? <laughs> so at that gym initially where I started, the ceiling height was not very high, but then <laughs> we went to a part of a podium that was higher. So yeah, it, it, it's- Why would they do that? Uh, it, it was not designed to be a gym. It was designed to yeah. be a, a concert hall, right? So you had that podium part, right? So in that podium part, it, the, the ceiling was much higher. So that's where we put the trampolines initially. I know now in the same location, they actually removed the, the, the ceiling, the fake ceiling that they have over the trampolines and they make holes so they can get to up to the, up to the, to the high ceiling that they have which it's still not very high but it's enough it's much higher than the ceiling that we have in the united states the united states really does not have buildings with high ceilings definitely yeah. not so so how high when you went to the podium then how high was the ceiling from the trampoline or from the floor uh, rather it was it, it was from the floor it was pretty tall but then with the podium it it cut a little bit uh, but it was it was enough for what we did at that time we never had really trouble thinking that we're going to touch the ceiling whenever we moved there like really 10 not. 11 meters something like, like no, that no 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 less than that less than that for sure around at the time it was six by four tramps so i think maybe eight meters eight nine meters no more than that no and how that. how many people were you training with growing up Ooh, not very many not very many um the gym had many, but then whenever you get to the top, of course, you lose a couple, right? But we had we had actually a, a good senior team that we were four initially, and then with life, they they quit, uh, and that from all those four, I stayed by myself. And I have I have several stories that I can talk about that senior team that we'll leave for a later episode. I have some really hard stories. Uh, emotionally uh, and we'll, we'll leave that we'll leave that for a whole other episode but yes okay uh, when i was when i was um, 19 then i moved on to lisbon to go to university and i switched clubs and that's when i started training with louise that most people know uh, and then i stayed in that club until i was 33 or 32 when i finished my career yeah i was and then years you young. and then you did you immediately move to the United States or did you take some time? I, I moved. Uh, so let's see. My last competition was July of 2012. And um, because I did not do the Olympic Games, I was just the alternate. And um, after that, I moved to the United States in January 2013. But uh, so I was coaching by then at that time already. So I just continued coaching and the transition was, was normal. Continued coaching, you moved to the United States, continued coaching. And is some is do you do you is something is coaching something that you are passionate about or you just you really love the sport and this is your way to stay in the sport? Well, I I think for me it was always my life. To be honest, it, people don't understand this in, in other countries, especially Portugal, because in Portugal to be a coach is not really a job. You can't really live from coaching. You either are you have another job that you do for, during the day and then you coach at night, otherwise. You, or you have uh, a spouse that has, does that and you are a little bit more free to just coach. But let's say you're by yourself, you're single, you really need to have a job and then coach at the end of the day, right? In Portugal, that, that was the perspective that I had all my life. So I looked at my life and... But it's really not realistic here in this country to do coaching 24-7. So I never really thought about it that way. 
it was not possible. So why even think that it was possible, right? Then when I moved to the United States, when this when this opportunity created into the United States, it just it was just a fulfilling of everything that I wanted since I was younger. <laughs> so it, it was a dream come true to something that I was impossible. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So what about you? That was, that's my life. What about you? Well, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I will. I apologize here. We can hear you just fine, but your, your screen is a little bit frozen. So I'm just going to wait oh. one second. Can you hear me? Yep. Having some technical difficulties here. Like I said, you, we can hear you just fine, but your screen is frozen. Maybe we can put a little picture of you, a little beautiful picture. <laughs> I, can, I can see you. Yeah. All right, so um, I'll go in a little bit about myself. So I grew up in New Jersey, the United States of America, and I was always active as a kid. And my mother signed me up for Taekwondo when I was three years old. <laughs> and I did Taekwondo, I love Taekwondo. I did it competitively. I got my black belt when I was nine and a half, 10. And then shortly after the school shut down and there was no other places to go. Um, this was in the late nineties and there was uh, no tiger shamans, uh, no chains or anything like that. So my mother said, okay, you're flexible, you're fast, you're strong. Um, football's out, you're not gonna be tall. Uh, baseball's out, you're not gonna be a big. Um, Basketball's out. You're going to be short. And she said, well, let's find out what you can get a scholarship. I to football. Football. <laughs> Maybe I could, I could have been like a kicker. Um, I could have been a quarterback. I don't know. I'm still, I think I'm still too, I don't know. Quarterbacks are pretty, pretty big. Um, so she wanted me something that I could get a scholarship with as well. So she said, you can either be a jockey, right? A cheerleader or a gymnast. And as like a 10 year old, I'm like, I don't want to do any of those things. And so I said, okay, fine. I guess gymnastics, I'll try gymnastics. So I go into our local gymnastics facility and there's- What, what was the name? What was the name? The, it was called Head Over Heels Gymnastics. And it's, okay. it's in Middletown. And, um, and then there was bars and spring floors and rings and tumble tracks and foam pits and trampolines and i was like this is awesome i don't know why this gets a bad rap you know it's like it, because artistic gymnastics usually gets a bad rap that it's for you know women because the women are are so good they're the ones seen on tv and so the the second that i did the class i was like i want to do this so i did about a few classes and then uh tatiana kovaleva who is a um, world champion from russia had moved to United States, in 19, uh, was starting, in 1996. Uh, yeah, she was world champion in 1996. She moved to the United States, I think in 1999, and she was starting a trampoline team. And so she asked my mother after the end of one of the classes, if I'd be interested in joining the trampoline team. My mom says, no, that sounds dangerous. We don't want to. <laughs> so then, then <laughs> so then the next week, the next week, um, my father comes to pick me up and she asked my father, Hey, your, your boy's pretty talented. We'd love, you know, for him to try the trampoline team. And he says, Hmm, okay, let's do it. So he signs me up for the <laughs> signs me up for the trampoline team. And the, the rest is history. I was on that team with the same coach for 17 years. So um, how long was your father just drinking water and bread and eating bread for that uh, decision? <laughs> I don't think she was. Yeah, I think he was in the doghouse for a little bit. But <laughs> for a little bit. once, but my mother, it was my mother was partly responsible because she was the one that brought me to the gymnastics gym, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, so I started doing trampoline pretty competitively. Four days a week, I think, was uh, starting out, and within one year, I had mobilized to level ten, and then the year after that. Two years after that, rather, I had mobilized to the uh, junior elite division, and I had won a few national so, so championships. You're a good boy. Me? How so? What do you mean? Yeah. 
you're always the, the, the awesome athlete that goes through the levels, like amazing and gets to the top. I mean, I had a, I, I think I, my progress was really fast, especially because I was older already. I was 10 or 11 years old, you True. know? So I think this is at this age, it's a lot easier to, to learn it is. more quick. Um, and that, that's I, something I we won. can get in in other in other episodes. The way that countries do differently their systems, because mine was a little bit like that too. I started at seven, right? And at seven, I only had mini tramps. So when actually I started jumping on a trampoline, I was much older as well. So which is totally different than the system that we have right now. But that's for another day. Keep going. Yeah. Um. So I competed with the same coach, and then I I won a bunch of national titles as a junior elite. I had, I think, a, a pretty good six career as a junior elite. I won a few international competitions like the Flower Cup, Grensland Cup, Pacific Rim. I think it, as when I was 15, I think I won every single competition the whole entire year, internationally and nationally. Nice. So I had a, I had a, a very good uh, career as a, as, a, as a junior. As a senior, I've won... Uh, some national titles. Logan Dooley and I won the World Cup Series in 2009, going to 2010 in synchronized trampoline. I finaled at some uh, World Cups. I competed at the Olympic Games in 2012, and then I was an alternate in 2016. And as far as coaching, I started coaching in 2005 with the the little ones, the pre-teamers, and since then have just been developing as a coach and still developing, but now I, I coach all levels, all age, all ages. Um, but I would say the, the group that I coach the most is probably our, our junior elite and youth elite group um, at our gym. And one thing I think you forgot to mention is that um, we are on the United States uh, national staff, if you will, that you're the senior national team uh, coordinator and I'm the junior national team coordinator. And you also That's forgot right. to mention that you sit on the FIG um, as, as the athlete representative. representative. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, um, correct. yeah. Have, so, I mean, have, that's, we have many, we have many things that uh, we discussed that we won't be able to bring here, unfortunately, but we'll try to bring everything that is not confidential. Right. Obviously right. there are some things that, you know, that are not passed through that we can't talk about yet, but, um, you know, but we'll, we'll try we'll bring, to, we'll bring you the latest scoop. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so then, so, yeah. So I, I, I have a question. I have a question. So yeah. uh, after the, that long career, which is beautiful in my opinion, uh, any any super high points that you are really really proud of, or super low points that you wish would have been different? Oh, for sure. There are so many things that I I wish would have been different, and things that I could still you know, accomplish. And a lot of people ask me, you know, why did you stop as a, uh, you know, training? Because I stopped at 26 years old, turning 27. So it's not old, still, but it's not young. It's, it's still, yeah. still doable. You know, I could probably yes. at least have done one more Olympic cycle. Uh, my body was pretty healthy. Um, but the, the truth is, I wasn't still willing to make the sacrifices that it takes to be an athlete. I'm very mm -hmm. passionate about coaching and I, I wanted to finish college and I did that. And when I was an athlete, the whole day was revolving around training. How long are you standing up? How long are you sitting? Are you, should you go for a walk or should you save your legs? You know, yep. are you going out to hang out with your friends? Oh, but you, you can probably only have one beer or no beers and you should probably only stay out for at least an only one hour, you know, and it's, and all of these things, your whole life revolves around training. And I wasn't able to travel and coach clinics at other gyms and meet other uh, coaches and athletes from other clubs. And, and I really wanted to do all of those things and I wasn't willing to to continue sacrificing all of that. So yes, I could have continued training, but I wasn't, I wasn't uh, willing to keep making those sacrifices. So what about you? You know, how did you know when to retire and how'd you feel when you decided to, to switch from athletes to, to coach? So, so that, that, that's a good point because um, 
I, I don't think I was as talented as you are as an athlete. I think you were far more talented than I was. Really, <laughs> Thank really. you. I, I think if, I think if people would uh, would see me when I was twelve and thirteen years old, would never think that I would go anywhere in, 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 in trampoline. Probably. And really? if I had other if I had other choices for other sports where I lived at the time, I'm pretty sure my 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 father probably would have put me somewhere else. We don't know. Then I'm glad he didn't. But I was not very talented. And uh, we, with that being said, I think my talent was definitely hard work. You know, I was the first one in the gym and the, the last one leaving. And I would do everything that I need to do in the meantime to be a better athlete. Maybe except eat well, but that's something different. Okay. But apart from the hard work inside the gym, no one would beat me. No one would beat me. And I, and, and I, I worked for as long as I wanted and I, and I, and I was motivated. And I got to the end and I, I, I think that I feel fulfilled everything that I wanted. And what was that? Of course, I wanted to go to the Olympic Games when it became an option. Because when I started, it wasn't even an option. In, 19, in 1998, when I did my first world championships, we did not know that the Olympic Games were going to be in 2000. Or I did not know. In 1999, when we had the first qualification for the Olympic Games, was something like, wow, the Olympic Games. So I started the sport without even thinking about the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games was something that was brought up differently for me than what than we, have, we have for this generation right now. And with that, my goal was to do as many world championships as I, as I could. That was always a goal I had. I always wanted to be world champion. I was very, very close in double mini, for example, to be world champion. I always wanted to be world champion. Um, I was by team, I guess, in double mini. Uh, but when I finished my career, I felt totally and absolutely fulfilled with what I did. So I, I was already at the point, like you explained, and that was really, really well, well, well said, that I felt that I could be more useful helping other people, other athletes, other coaches, than I was actually willing to put the work for my career. And I was already 32 at the time, so it was not that young. Yes, people still jump with the older ages than that, but I feel like my body was already telling me, it's time, it's time. and I felt that I was I was really willing and I really liked to to help other people achieve their goals and to coach and to co to help other coaches and I really liked it so that was a that was an easy transition for me it was really really an easy transition for me I started coaching women's gymnastics in 2005 so I helped uh, a coach from Portugal from the same club that I was so basically I would get to the club at at uh, four o'clock I would go with the, I would stay with the artistic gymnast and with the other coaches and then go up to the to the next floor because it, it, in in Europe buildings are really big so there are several floors with several gyms so we would go to the, to the floor where the artistic gym is and then at 7 30 or 7 o'clock when it was time for me to train I would come down to the to the to the main to the ground floor and I would train so that's that was my life for six years and then only in 2011, around 2011, I actually started coaching trampoline. Before that, I only coached artistic. So when people talk with me about coaching artistic, I, I, know, I know exactly what it is to coach artistic, in, in Portugal at least. I think the United States have a whole new dimension for it. So yeah, I would agree. It's different. Yeah, but uh, it was, it's, it's a passion, right? It was, like I said in the beginning, something that I always wanted to do in my life. So it just became a natural transition. And then when this opportunity of coming to the United States showed up, then it was even better. But yeah, I'm very so, happy with my career. I'm very happy. I'm very happy with what I did. You know, I, I don't think anyone thought that me would I would get to the Olympic Games. Simple as that. And the, or even make final at the Olympic Games. I believe I believe right now I'm still the only Portuguese that made final in any gymnastic discipline in Portugal. Hopefully to change. I, Hopefully. And in men's or what about yep. women's men's men's women's rhythmic wow mm, yep that's impressive i believe trampoline so, is the only one that has one that's awesome that's so good for trampoline so, um yeah. let me ask you another question for me when i started coaching it helped me tremendously as an athlete it, it changed the way i was thinking the way i was communicating with my coach um and then it was changing the way that I would speak to, to my students. Um, did you feel the same, the same way or something similar? I, I felt exactly the same way. And, and th this is the interest, interesting thing. When we learn trampoline and we are young, we do stuff, but we don't know how we do stuff or why we do stuff, right? So right. when I say stuff, but let's, 
go into skills this moment, right? So we do the skills, and but you don't know how you're doing them. You went through the progressions and you're doing and you, you do them, but you never really have to break down that skill to explain it to someone, right? Whenever you start coaching and you have to break down the biomechanics of that skill to explain it to someone, then a light just rides up in your mind and goes, whoa, how did I never see this this way? Right, yep. and you automatically is becoming a are you becoming a better athlete because you are trying to explain something to someone else. That that's why when I coach, I try right now. I have this like little dolls, right? One of the little dolls, like plastic articulated dolls that I call Giselle, and uh, I have my kids explain to me the biomechanics of certain skills when I see that they don't understand it and or that they're not performing it correctly. It just if they understand it, which not all do, but if they understand it, just it's like a, it's like a light clicking inside that brain, open, like turning on and bang. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That was, I think, yeah. I think that's the reason why the last years of my career were much better than the first years. Yes, I did go to the Olympic Games when I was 24, but me and Diogo won the World Cup Series in Synchro in 2011 when I was 31. Right, that was, and I was fourth place individual in that World Cup series. It was I, I was finalist four times, fourth place. <laughs> so when I was 31, and no one would probably say that I would be able to do anything at that point in time. No one. So, mm -hmm. maybe not even do me. you do you feel like you were a different athlete maybe after the age of 27, 28 than you were in your early 20s? For sure. Mentally. For sure. I, I, yes. I'll, Mental, what would your training look physically. like? So when I was about 28 years old, I started studying uh, airline pilot. So I had classes really early in the, in the day. So my, my training schedule shifted tremendously during those days. I was lucky that my coach was able to, to come and train with me whenever there was a chance, right? There were some trains at 8 in the morning that I always hated to train in the morning. Always. I literally always hated to train in the morning. So there were some trains at 8 in the morning and my, my mindset of training just changed completely, you know. The, the, it was a lot more quality instead of quantity at that time. A lot more. It changed completely. And I, I think it helped. I guess it helped because my last years, even mentally, I was stronger. I knew I could do things at any moment in time if I had to. And, and, I, and I could. So let, yeah. let, let me ask you another question. So what besides what are your hobbies, degrees, what did you study? Who is Nuno outside of trampoline? So there, there really is nothing much to it. So I studied airline pilot in Portugal because uh, I, that's what I saw that I had a, a connection with that, that, I, that I felt that I, I would like to do. And then interestingly enough, in 2008 comes this crisis that everyone heard about, right? this economical crisis throughout the world and there was no job. And, and so that's when I started studying. I finished with in 2012. At the middle, middle of 2012, I finished the, that course, and, and I was actually uh, flying a skydiver plane on the weekends to, to make some hours. And then I get this invitation to come to the United States to coach. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what do I do to this course that I just <laughs> took so long to do and I spent all this money with? So I came to the United States and nothing applies. I would have to start basically everything from the beginning and do all the tests. But the only thing that would apply would be the flight time after I have the test. So I haven't flied, I haven't flew since, since then. So I skydive now. <laughs> I am the person that they carry on the plane so I can skydive. So my father was a skydiver all his life. He was, he was in, the, in the Portuguese army and he never really let me skydive a lot, a lot or, or anything. I started the course when I was 16 and I only did three jumps. Okay, it was really good. It was the most amazing thing in my life at that time. Okay, I was so fascinated, three jumps, okay. And, and then after that, I, 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 I never, he never scheduled any more jumps and I never asked him and, uh, and it, just, it was just weird, I guess. And it never happened, never jumped after that. And then when I, come, when I moved to the US, I was like, I'm gonna skydive as much as I can now. <laughs> so I saved some money, got the, got the course and uh, now I jump whenever I want. So. And what was your father's reaction when he found out you were skydiving in USA? Uh, it, it, it was good because his, his argument was always, while you have trampoline, you should not get hurt. So finish your career first, yeah. then you can skydive. There you go. So, so then that was, was always, yeah. 
yeah, that was always his, his, his argument. So then I finished trampoline, there was no more argument, no more argument, right? So yeah, I just went skydiving. And, and then he already came here, we already skydived together, we got some good videos and pictures and everything. And yeah, it was, it was very good. That's very awesome. Good. So what about you? I know you skydived um, a little bit. Yeah, so outside of trampoline, so I, I studied um, business management at uh, Rutgers University, at Rutgers Business School. And my hobbies, I live not too far from the beach, so usually on an off day, you'll catch me at the beach. But yeah, I used to skydive. Uh, when I turned 18 for my 18th birthday, I went skydiving and fell in love with it. And I would go and jump through the summers up until the year, up until 2011. The summer of 2011, before the World Championships qualifying for Olympic Games, I stopped to uh, literally one year away from the Olympic Games. My whole life changed. I changed. said, this is, this is it. I'm not going to let not even one ounce of distraction or, or anything affect this. You know, I'm going to be an absolute perfect athlete for at least one year. Not that I wasn't perfect, but I mean, there was, yeah. I would not, for one year, I did not touch a, as a 21 year old, for one year out, did not touch a drop of alcohol. I was eating clean. And so I stopped skydiving then. And then after the Olympics, life just started happening. And then, you know, unfortunately, no I don't get to skydiving. jump anymore. No more skydiving for me. I would love to go and again one day. But it, you know what? It's it's a lot of this. And it's and you know what else? It's a lot of this. It's a lot of time that takes, for especially you, because... For you, it's mm -hmm. even more now because you would not have a certification anymore. You have to start from from the beginning almost. But interesting right. fact for everyone to know, my first parachute, I bought it from Steven. That's true. Yeah, for way too little of money. Mm, disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I that, made him a favor to buy that parachute. No, it was, that was a beautiful it. rig. I think it, I'm trying to remember. It was a beautiful canopy. So the it beautiful was a beautiful canopy, canopy. There's no yeah. Doubt. Yeah, There's no I'm doubt trying to remember. remember when I'm trying I have to remember. right now, it's even more beautiful. Oh well, for sure. Well, what do you what do you fly right now? Well, you how it depends on how how much you're weighing. You're like a one eighty probably two hundred. Uh, no, no. You fly no, a, You fly a two twenty. I fly a one twenty nine. One twenty nine. People, people will not understand what that means, but it means that it's a hundred and twenty nine square foot of material <laughs> that is over your head. That's <laughs> basically. With all the baby so weight you've been putting on, I don't know if that's a big enough parachute to hold you up, Nuno. You might be, you might be right. But uh, why don't we go back to trampoline then? <laughs> Fair enough. So um, tell us a little bit about your coaching in the United States here and you know, the kind of the journey you've been on as a coach. So... <laughs> Actually, since I came to the United States, the roller coaster has not, has not stopped, has not stopped, obviously, right? Because I came to the United States, uh, I coached in a club uh, called the Matrix Gym. Uh, at that time, every, life was just amazing. <laughs> Still is amazing, but at that time, it was even more amazing. I had nothing to do on the weekends. I could do whatever I want. <laughs> I was making good money just for myself. And uh, people start recognizing your value when you start uh, incorporating more things and committees. And, uh, and then three years later, uh, uh, national, national coach and uh, time just runs away. <laughs> and I, I find myself, if it was not for, due to the current situation, I would find myself with literally no time traveling every weekend almost. And uh, not that I don't like it, I like it, but... I also have a family now with two beautiful girls and it just, there's no, not enough time for family <laughs> not anymore, but uh, I still enjoy what I do. And it, the, the thrill of helping other people and other, other coaches succeed and, and, and to see the evolution of these athletes that we, that I saw six years ago when I moved here and that you work with, I work with, and that all these coaches work with and when, where they're getting on their evolution is just, just phenomenal. There is nothing that can beat that. But yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of like watching kids grow up, right? It's you like know, watching, watching kids them, grow up. You're absolutely right. You know, you you even if it's not your kid, you you know, you're still proud. Yeah, and, absolutely, absolutely. And, and 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 we look at 
all these kids, those that do make wags and those that don't make wags, and uh, it's just phenomenal. The, the, how they how they grow as individuals and, and, and as athletes, it's just it's just phenomenal. It is what it is. And knowing that I you agree. are a part of that, knowing that you're a part of that is even, even more brilliant, I think, especially for those that, that we coach on a daily basis at the gym and you see how they evolved as individuals and and, and, yep. and to think back, for example, and, and see, oh my goodness, that kid did not even know how to do a double back. I was the first one to taught, teach them a double back or a first half of it. Now they're doing trips, and triples and, and all those things, right? And you're like, yeah. Wow, that's that's it's it's really it's really good to see that that hard work and paid off. But yeah, so it has been a roller coaster. All these new positions in committees and 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 the national coaching staff and keeps us busy. You know that as well. Oh and yes, I, I fear I fear uh, I fear other people do not understand as well how much that keeps us busy. <laughs> no, it's definitely uh, it's definitely time consuming. All of those meetings Absolutely. and there's a lot there's a lot more that goes into these procedures and rules and and events that are going on than than people than people realize well i think we've pretty much talked about ourselves as much as people will listen to so why don't we why don't we wrap it up and um yeah we have a few exciting topics that we can that we have prepared for the next few episodes so i'm really excited to dive into those conversations and uh, hopefully this picks up some traction. And if not, hopefully the, even if it's three people that listen, hopefully those people are passionate I'll be happy. And, and we can help yep. those three people. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Nuno. And thank you guys for listening. And we'll talk to you again soon. See you around.